no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for space. Hello and welcome to the Terran Space Academy, where we help prepare you for a bright future in the space industry. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. We appreciate you. In 1914, Robert Goddard patented a design for a liquid-fueled rocket, and in March of 1926, he launched the first working model. It was a gasoline and liquid oxygen-powered rocket and was only a partial success. Goddard is revered today, but in his time, he was ridiculed by the newspapers, where learned writers of the day pontificated that without something to push against, rockets won't work in space. This statement shows that a fundamental ignorance about the laws of physics is not a recent invention. Goddard could not get funding for his rockets, even from the U.S. military. He continued his research with limited resources and lived to see the Germans, with a better funded program, jump far ahead of everyone else and launch their liquid-fueled V-2 rockets into space. Goddard died in August of 1945 having just lived long enough to see Germany surrender, despite their rockets, in May. But during his lifetime, he evaluated different potential rocket fuels and decided that, for energy efficiency, density, and ease of use, nothing beats methane. We covered these factors in depth in this lesson. Methane can be stored at the same temperature as liquid oxygen and is much easier to use than the more efficient liquid hydrogen fuel which is why companies like Stoke Space, Arion Group, Relativity Space, Rocket Lab, Land Space, ULA Blue Origin, and finally SpaceX, all use methane fuel. And I am proud to say that the first methane-fueled rocket to make it to space was the Terran-1 from the American company Relativity Space. The Terran-1 is a mostly 3D printed rocket made with the amazing Stargate metal printing system. But while the Terran 1 passed the Kármán line, a second stage failure kept the payload from reaching orbit, leaving the honor of building the first orbital methane-fueled rocket to China. I once argued at a space conference with a former SpaceX executive about the technological advancements that China was making in space science. He argued that no authoritarian system could find innovative and creative technological solutions. I disagreed, arguing that people are people, and with a population of more than one billion, China will have more than its share of brilliant designers. In fact, I think it is sometimes easier for well-funded and dictatorial regimes to complete massive engineering projects, as they don't need to fight with the Congress for funding, or worry about the next election. That doesn't mean I want the Chinese to be first in space, or that I think authoritarian systems are cool. It means that denying reality helps no one. China has, in fact, made incredible progress. Blue Origin was founded in 2000 and has spent tens of billions of dollars and so far has put nothing into orbit. In that same time period, China went from having launched and recovered one uncrewed spacecraft, the Shenzhou-1, to launching its first Taikonaut into orbit in 2003, its first lunar probe in 2007, its first spacewalk in 2008, and its first orbital laboratory in 2012, docking a Shenzhou-9 capsule that same year. In 2013, they deployed a rover to the moon, with the first ever soft landing on the far side in 2019. In 2020, they returned samples from the moon, the first country to do so in almost half a century. In 2021, they successfully landed a rover on Mars and put three Taikonauts into their own orbital space station that same year. And finally, on the 11th of July, 2023, they launched the first methane-fueled rocket into space. This rocket had been built by LandSpace. LandSpace is a private company or as private as any company gets in China. It was founded in 2015 by Zheng Chang Wu, 
who built a $1.5 billion assembly and test plant in Jiaxing, and another facility for intelligent manufacturing in Huzhou. Its first rocket was a three-stage solid propellant rocket system called Zhukui-1. This rocket failed to make it into orbit. Zhukui means vermilion bird, by the way. The next rocket was methane-fueled and was called the Zhukui-2. This is the rocket that beat every other space company in the United States and indeed the world. The rocket launched from the Zhukuan Spaceport, which is a military facility in the Gobi Desert. U.S. military tracking systems confirmed the success, recording the payload to be at an average orbital altitude of 450 kilometers. The rocket system is 49.5 meters tall and right now can put a payload of 1.5 metric tons into a polar sun-synchronous orbit. The rocket has a diameter of 3.35 meters, making it smaller than the Falcon 9, which is 70 meters tall, with a diameter of 3.7 meters. The Zhukui has two stages. The first stage has a total thrust of 2,680 kilonewtons, produced by four TQ-12 rocket engines. I can't find an official launch mass, but with a total thrust of 2,680 kilonewtons, Assuming a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.5, we would get a weight of 1,781 divided by 9.81, or 1 standard gravity, giving us a mass of 182 metric tons. But other sources say that the launch mass is 219 metric tons. Working back the other way gives us a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.25. It won't be fast off the pad, but land space is working to improve these engines. TQ stands for Tianque, which means Skylark. These engines are 3.9 meters tall with a diameter of 1.5 meters. They have a nozzle ratio of 45, meaning the area at the end of the nozzle is 45 times greater than the area of the throat. They have a chamber pressure of 10.1 megapascals, which is about 101 bar. They produce up to 670 kilonewtons of thrust each at sea level, and these engines use a gas generator open cycle. The engines were first assembled and tested in 2019 at the Land Space Facility in Hanzhou. 400 test fires were completed by 2021. 37 of these engines were built and tested, with one of them running for 3,357 seconds with 11 restarts. That's a total of 55.95 minutes, almost an hour, which makes this a very durable machine. Over that time, Land Space increased the engine thrust by 9%, and the specific impulse by 40 seconds, giving it an efficiency of 284 seconds at sea level and 337 seconds in vacuum. You may notice that this is a little less than the SpaceX version, but open cycle engines can never be as efficient as closed cycle. They also reduced the mass of the engine by 100 kilograms. Its maiden flight was in December of 2022. The TQ-12 engines on the first stage worked perfectly but the Vernier engines on the second stage failed, and the rocket did not make it to orbit. The second stage uses a single TQ-12 vacuum-optimized engine, which means it has a much larger nozzle, with four TQ-11 Vernier engines, which you can see here, surrounding the TQ-12. The TQ-11 has the same specific impulse in vacuum, which is the only place it's designed to operate, as the TQ-12, 337 seconds. It also has a pressure of 101 bar in the combustion chamber, but it is only 1.1 meters tall and 0.28 meters in diameter. It has a maximum thrust of 80 kilonewtons. Here you can see the TQ-11 making fine adjustments to help the second stage get to a correct and stable orbit. Land Space intends to land the first stage of the Zhu Kui, just like SpaceX lands the Falcon 9, and the TQ-12 is designed to be reusable. Land Space is already working to upgrade the TQ-12 engines for its new Block 2 version. This will use TQ-12A engines for the first stage and TQ-15A engines for the second stage. Here is a TQ-15A being test fired. The TQ-15A has a thrust of up to 836 kilonewtons, which is getting close to the SpaceX Merlin's 981 kilonewtons used on the Falcon 9 rocket system. The TQ-15A is 400 kilograms lighter than the TQ-12-11 combination, and it uses thrust vectoring, angling up to 4 degrees and does not need Vernier engines, and can throttle down to half power and be restarted to circularize orbits. 
Using these engines, Landspace hopes to get 6,000 kilograms to low Earth orbit, and up to 4,000 to a sun-synchronous orbit. Now, this success does not mean that Landspace and China are going to dominate the space industry and build the first colony on the moon. As you can see here, in order of size, the Stokes Space Fully Reusable Rocket System, the Ariane Group Themis, the Relativity Space Terran 1, the Rocket Lab Neutron, the Land Space Yuque, then Relativity again with the Terran R, and the ULA Vulcan, the Blue Origin New Glenn, and finally the SpaceX Starship, are all methane fueled rockets. Seven of the nine are launching from the United States, including the two with the potential to put colonies on the moon New Glenn and Starship. Six of these, Stoke, Zhukwe, Neutron, Terran R, New Glenn, and Starship, all reuse their first stage. Four of these, Stoke, Neutron, Terran R, and Starship, have a reusable second stage, putting them in a class of their own. But if the Soviet Union proved anything, it is that you can be first at almost everything. First satellite in orbit, first man in space, first spacewalk, first woman in space, first probe to land on Venus, first rover on the moon and Mars, and first sample return from the moon. And be capable of massive feats of incredible engineering. And still be beaten by someone who learns from your success and goes one step further. What I am saying is that America and the rest of the world need to keep that lesson in mind also. Because while America will always be first to the moon, that might not matter in the long run. If we have to get clearance from the Chinese Space Force to land there in the future. Something to think about. Thanks for listening and stay safe at Astro Proterra.